Um, hey, those are the big basic ones. Awesome. And we are recording um, just so that people are aware. Um, so none of you are on video, but if you are uncomfortable, just making sure everyone is aware of that. So, and you can still see my screen, Jay. I can still see your screen. And the other reminder is that everyone is on mute since this is a webinar. Yes, so you guys will not be able to ask questions verbally. So that's why, again, uh, just making sure that everyone can use the Q&A um, to ask any questions. That would be awesome. Um, okay, let's get going. Okay, so just first wanted to um, talk about this a little bit around our mission. Um, I had gotten a few comments too, just through like the question of whether, you know, some of these changes are in line with our mission. The answer is yes. So I just wanted to bring that up again. That's a big um, thing that we value in Special Olympics in terms of just our mission. What's our driving point? Our mission is our athletes and participation. Um, but obviously our goal is to provide year-round sports training um, to kids and adults with intellectual disabilities. Um, you guys can, can read the rest, um, but that is our goal. That's what we continue to drive towards as a North Star. Um, and then also um, just how um, keeping that in the forefront anytime we're making decisions. So really just wanted to address that from the beginning around our mission um, is huge value point for us and why we exist. Um, so just know that that is um, part of the conversation tonight. All right, our meeting agenda, um, we'll give a little bit of an overview, um, talk a little bit about goals, we'll talk about um, why and how some of these decisions were made, um, talk about, um, we'll review the season model, um, sorry about that, we'll review the season model, um, and, oops, sorry, just going to close one thing, um, review the season model between what are we currently doing, what we'll be doing in the future, um, addressing some questions and then doing some closeouts and follow-ups. So it'll be a quick hour. I know we had quite a few questions in the first webinar. If you're able to make the first webinar, um, some of the content will be really similar. Um, and we've integrated um, a couple more of quest questions, but I think after tonight, if there's not anything that has been answered, please make sure to use that link. I'm sure that Jay will, will drop it in the chat. It is on the website. It just has like a continuous feedback link for us. Um, that's something that we plan to keep active. Um, so even as throughout, you know, the next few seasons, if there's things you guys are seeing that are challenges that you want to bring forth, please continue to, to utilize that. Okay, so we're going to go to goals. Um, our goals for this are, are a few. Um, I think that overall is just a better overall athlete experience, quality of competition and events offered. Um, I think it's challenging to consider any change or model that will fully um, you know, work perfectly. Um, I think that there's challenges um, to every model, whether it's facilities or some of the things that we deal with, but just a better all overall athlete experience was the goal of this. Um, and that we'd have an increase the number of local and recreational sports opportunities, that we would um, boost dedicated training time for our athletes and partners. So slightly elongating each of our seasons from one to two weeks, just to allow for more training time, more time for coaches to actually record scores. Um, increasing the number of coaches and volunteers who can support from one season to the next. You'll see in the why part that that was kind of a big um, feature of why we were trying to um, shift into this model was just making sure that um, coaches have enough time between seasons to prepare for the coming season to recruit other volunteers um, and just be able to get some respite. Um, and then better trained and better overall um, coaches, which great. We have some amazing coaches. So I think um, just giving more space to um, at some point um, start to fold in more coaches education um, that we could utilize in those, those spaces. Okay, so how do we get to this decision? So there was a, uh, we started this process really post pandemic. Um, it's been a long time, uh, a long journey in terms of um, making this decision and, and pulling in multiple people into this conversation, but it's a big post um post-pandemic shift to, um, you know, just reconsider how we were doing um, and offering seasons. And so what were the things that we were hearing? Just wanted to list a few here was just around, um, you know, our existing model really limits our coaches' ability to recruit more volunteers between seasons. So is there any way we could try to find more space between season, limiting our coaches' ability to prepare for each season due to immediate start of season, one right after the next? 
um, our, our existing system is really, um, we have a spring games as an example, our season for summer or for fall would start the day after, which is, can be really challenging in terms of just from a coaching perspective that, that we've heard quite um, a lot over many years. Um, athletes continue to be frustrated by divisioning and competition structure. So just needing more opportunities to be able to offer league play or facilitate better divisioning. And so that's a challenge we have in Special Olympics for multiple reasons. Um, I think I could host an entire webinar just on that challenge around the concept of um, and challenges of hosting league play or being able to facilitate more localized competition. So I think um, just giving more time and trying to work through how do we provide better um, divisioning structures um, or competition structures that um, make the competition as fair as possible. Um, another one was health partners recommending off seasons between seasons to reduce the chance of injury. Uh, we worked really work closely with Kaiser Permanente and had um, some leadership involved who just made recommendations based off of kind of what they were looking at in our seasons and being involved with USA and World Games um, and just kind of reviewing kind of the ideal recovery time between each seasons. Um, and then the last piece was just reviewing other um, Special Olympic states who are in these models who had made the shift years prior, um, who had really seen success. A big one that I can um, share was New York has been in a three season model for three years or 20 years, which is a long time. Um, and so I spent a lot of time with them just kind of teasing through how this has worked, um, what the benefits were, what their long-term vision is, um, and so a lot of that was in alignment with what we are hoping to do here um, in terms of just that offering more localized competition. So, um, and I think there's just that additional note of um, the previous Washington model. So for those who have been around forever, Washington has always had four seasons hypothetically, but for those who have been around, you might remember that the fall season really, all, really only had bowling in it and it was only offered as a regional competition. There was actually no state games that was involved with that um, that um, season previously. So really for us, when we look at a season, that's really like offering, what we hope to have is all levels of competition from local, regional to state. Um, and in our case, we lack on the local level, but we offer, what we wanna see is a more comprehensive and full scope of saying like, you could train recreationally and compete regionally, and then also have a chance to qualify to state um, and so that was something that we didn't have in all four seasons previously. So similar in terms of kind of a shift to having three seasons that has all models available from recreational or local to regional and then to state. Okay, so I've been asked this question quite a few times, but who are the individuals and committees involved? Um, there are quite a few people, so not possible to really go through and list all the groups or all the individual names of the people who are consulted um, but know that um, we had a coaches steering committee who had a representation from two or three coaches from each region um, and that varied in size of program to, um, you know, and I think one of the things we looked for here was just um, that they were programs that had all year round training because um, that was going to be the biggest impact is really working with programs who are dealing with that season to season challenge. Um, so really getting those coaches opinions was a big deal. Um, and coaches who have kind of been around and familiar with how things have run. Um, our athlete committee, which included our previous board chair and then members of our leadership committees um, that was through the board and then also our leadership committees that um, involve athletes. Um, some are family members. Um, those, that also represents an overlap with board members. Um, and then games management team members were consulted. Big factor of this is really looking at our state games and what capacity and ability or flexibility did we have to move games to either different locations or different dates. Um, so a lot of the dates were dictated around just state games. So um, a good example is maintaining our presence in Wenatchee was a big priority. Um, and there is not a lot of flexibility to that date, A, because of snow, and just B, availability with the city, um, just with other events going on. So a lot of considerations and angles that we took to just look at what were the best options in terms of providing um, the best possible structure. Um, board members were of course included in this and then staff as well. Um, staff are an important piece um, just because there's the operation side, the day-to-day. -day, um, so um, factoring in those um, 
voices was important. So lots of voices. Um, I think um, it's always hard because you want to include more people and make sure that we um, include as many as possible. But I think there is a limit to how many can be included. And so that's why we're also just asking for you guys to give feedback. I think um, one thing I shared in the last uh, webinar is that this will be an iterative process. So we'll go through this next year, see how things go. And if there's big things that you know, we are seeing that aren't working or that you guys are seeing that are not working, please share with us. Um, it's something that we'll just continue to evaluate of saying like, great, this is looking how we hoped or hey, this is something that needs to be adjusted um, and take a look at it um, and, and make adjustments. That's our goal is we are a learning organization um, too. So I think nothing we're gonna do is gonna be perfect out of the gate, but I think making it as best we can. So please continue to um, let us know as we go what are the challenges that you guys are seeing? Um, and I know we'll get to some of those in the in the questions here. So, all right, going over season models. So, and I apologize if I'm looking at two screens because they're up above me here in this setting. So, apologize for that. Um, but um, this is our current season structure, um, which just shows um, our four seasons as they are laid out right now. So you can see. Um, you know, the examples are from this year and just in terms of dates. Um, and really the big thing to note here is kind of something that I mentioned um, that we're really jumping from one season to the next. Um, there is no break in between or off season to even just, you know, um, worry about registration or trying to recruit volunteers or work on facilities or other components that come up for some of our teams um, or even families just trying to plan ahead. Excuse me. Um, so, Summer season, the challenge of our existing, a few challenges were that our um, existing summer season is only nine weeks total, which is very short, very, very short. And so um, our SOI recommendations for training are actually six to eight weeks of training, which I know seems long, it goes by fast. Um, and so that was kind of a priority, at least in this next iteration was to try to give those weeks of training or allow for just at least that flexibility. We recognize that sometimes teams start later, um, but so giving enough time for, um, to get enough practices in, whether that's submitting bowling scores or swimming um, times, things like that, um, giving enough time to have dedicated training um, for the recommendation by Special Mix International. Um, all of those seasons are five to seven weeks of training, so a little bit shorter, as I mentioned, um, and then we go right into the region competition. So. Again, wanting to just think through how do we add in a bit more time to be able to um, try to implement some local competition that is, leads into region events. I think that's part of how we'll resolve some of the divisioning issues that we've had is just by understanding um, on a smaller geographical level how some of our teams are matching up against each other. Um, and again, that won't apply to every sport, but I think we're mostly talking about team sports here. Um, that that's a challenge for in terms of getting those um, divisions correct. Um, and then as I said, next season starts just as the previous one ends. So no off season in between um, that structure there. So moving into the future season structure. Um, so the block looks bigger, but it's actually just laid out a bit differently if you look into these boxes. So again, using 2024, and 2025 into the example is because that is kind of the timeline that we're operating on is we would actually kick off um, this new season model, um, this fall season, which for us would be an end of July start time to an early November. So that actually shifts our fall games from being the second week of um, November to the first week, um, which um, it seemed like the feedback was relatively positive about that just because that second week is the week before Thanksgiving. Um, and so there's some challenges. Um, again, it's not going to be perfect. We try to navigate holidays and things as the best we can, um, but that seemed to work out pretty well there. Um, recognizing that starting in the end of July is a challenge, but um, it's July 29th, so it is pretty close to August. So as the years go, we'll actually see this shift into an August time frame, which again, um, is a bit earlier than we had done for fall, and we recognize there's some challenges with that. But so then early November, and then we have a two-week off-season period from right after the games until that um, 
18th of November, which is then that week of um, Thanksgiving. So again, um, whether teams start practicing that week, we recognize it's a challenge, but I think just giving coaches the opportunity to plan and get set up for facilities before they are running into holidays. And then we have holidays in December. So again, some challenges there. Um, winter season would then start the end of November. Um, so after um, we'd be, um, sorry, starting that November 18th timeframe um, would be the start of the season until that early March timeframe. So as I mentioned earlier, winter games wouldn't change. That was kind of a pillar, just a main point of like, what of our other games are flexible and, and which ones are not. And winter games was really the one that needed to stay that weekend. So that was a pretty important piece to build off of. So that will stay the same. Um, and then we'll have a two week season off period again, um, following those games immediately until mid-March, um, at, at which point we would start our new iteration of the 2025 spring season, which would be that um, end of March timeframe until the end of June. Um, or mid to end of June. So our state games for spring of 2025 would actually be um, the June 20th through 22nd. Um, so again, challenges to each, um, each of the, around the dates in terms of graduation and stuff like that, we recognize, um, but these are the dates that um, seem to work um, largely. So the big difference here between um, the one that I previously shared as to this one is now we will have a summer recreation period. So this summer is one that will be slightly longer just as, because of we're moving, kind of moving from our old uh, model into our new model. And so there is um, unfortunately a transition period that needs to take place. So for us, the, um, the season recreation this summer will be slightly longer um, than we'd prefer, um, but it's not quite long enough for us to host games or to register or host region events um, that, season uh, would have been like seven or eight weeks. This is just too short for us to register and get region events stood up for that. Um, and so this um, summer, we'll be just be looking at a recreation period. Um, and I'll explain a little bit to that when I get to the, the next slide here. So just focusing on this. But in 2020, um, 2025, you'll see this kind of reset. Our um, summer recreation will only be four to five weeks, but the goal is that we're offering other activities so this would be the immediate time period after spring games to when fall season starts. There'd be that four to five weeks where we would do other things, whether that's programs trying cornhole, programs trying different types of sports, whether that's pickleball, um, you could do existing sports, you could continue golfing. Um, we, um, our goal is to try to offer more localized competition. Um, we already have quite a few programs who are running their own events. Um, and so tacking on to some of those events, offering other opportunities with partners, whether that's HoopFest or some of these other um, great things that exist during this time, um, offering health programming. Um, I, I know that the um, medical form screening as part of Healthy Athletes um, is really important. So how do we get that out and localized? How do we offer more young athletes during this time? We've talked about doing summer camps or sports clinics. So I think our goal is to not do nothing during this period, we will be very much doing programming. It will just be, um, might look a little bit different, um, which we will give it a go and, and see um, what people recommend, what they like and what they don't like. So, um, but again, this overall structure is ranging from 12 to 14 weeks total. Um, so a little bit longer by one to two weeks per season. In our previous model, um, our shortest season was that summer season, which was nine weeks. Um, and then our longest season um, was kind of ranging between 12 and 13 weeks. So it's about a week to two weeks that are added um, to each of these seasons to just allow for a bit more time, um, again, to train. Um, so you'll see, as noted in the next one, is the six to eight weeks instead of five to seven. Um, and then adding that off season um, period between each season and then also having a summer recreation. So we're really not going without programming um, our plan is very much to fill in the gaps and make sure that we are um, providing as much opportunity as we can for our athletes. Okay, so um, our 2025 sports by season, I really like this slide um, in terms of just like how it looks. Um, it's easy to read. So wanted to make sure that this was laid out um, easily. So what sports are we gonna offer when? It's a hot question. So for winter season, 
Um, none of the sports will actually change. It will be the exact same sports that will be offered in winter season. Um, so alpine skiing, basketball, cheer, cross-country skiing, figure skating, speed skating, snowboarding, snowshoeing, quite a few. Um, busy lineup, busy season, lots going on. Got to take advantage of our snow. Hopefully it will be better over the next few years than it was this year. Um, but um, overall, that season is the same. Spring is the one that we see the most impact in terms of many of those summer sports um, are moving into the spring season. So golf, bocce, and softball will be joining spring season um, in terms of when they are offered. Um, and I will get to the, some of this in the FAQs, but obviously some challenges with um, timeframes there, um, with weather, whether the weather that's east or west side. So I'll talk about that a little bit in the FAQs. Um, so for spring season of 2025 will be athletics, cycling, bocce, golf, soccer, softball, and swimming. So um, pretty close to the numbers that we see in winter in terms of sports offered. But again, quite a few sports to be able to choose from, um, which is great. Our summer recreation is that yellow box. So um, like I said, lots of opportunity to be able to um, explore and do new things and kind of build, build this how we um, would like to see. I know that we've had a lot of feedback, um, just I think from, well, I shouldn't say a lot, a few athlete leaders who are really excited about potentially leading the conversation about what could be offered in these seasons and how athlete leaders could, you know, lead young athletes or do different components um, of the leadership there, which would be great. Um, but things to see in, rec in summer season would be, again, recreational play. So this is just continuing to do sports and competing with some of your local teams in different, different types of sports, trying new sports, camps and clinics, health programming, um, young athletes. I mean, this is kind of a, a limitless opportunity. If you guys do have ideas for summer, please let us know. As I mentioned, I think one of the things that um, got brought up is just also, we have partners who we work through um, that offer great programs too, like HoopFest or Three on Three Basketball in Everett. Um, we have other teams who are already ho hosting events who are wanting and willing to take more teams, whether that's Hot Bocce on the east side, um, Yay Deb, or Bocce Extravaganza on the west side. Um, we have some great volunteers who are doing some fun things um, already um, that are excited to add folks in. So um, fall season then in 2025 will be bowling, flag football, gymnastics, pickleball, powerlifting, tennis, and volleyball. So the sports that we offer now will are bowling, flag football, gymnastics, and volleyball. So the sports that we'll um, be adding in uh, will be pickleball, powerlifting, and tennis. So pickleball is a big one that's come up. Um, so we'll be adding that as a sport, um, which will be exciting. I think um, part of the conversation we'll continue to have is really around this idea of sports advancement, which um, if you weren't on the call last time, I spent a little bit of time talking about this, and I will when we get into the FAQs. But um, the example here is that um, sports um, are driven locally and through the grassroots instead of for us right now in our existing model, we put a, we've put sports at state and then there's people who automatically qualify to state. Um, and so just as an effort to reconcile that system to make sure it's fair for athletes who are competing in other sports who do have to qualify, we would um, only offer pickleball at regional and state when we actually get to the appropriate number to be able to offer um, good competition in those sports. So I'll go the, into that a little bit more in depth um, but it's uh, an exciting thing in terms of um, us kind of um, throwing in a few new sports on our end um, to start developing. Okay, I'm just gonna take a little drink of water here before I get into my questions. How am I doing? Um, any other questions, Jay, before I jump into these ones? I think you're going to address them in the Q&A, this next section, but if not, we'll get through them. Okay, great. Okay, so I have a little list of questions um, that I put together just based off of the feedback we received. And so um, I'll run through, I think there's about 10 that were kind of the main themes of feedback. And so like Jay said, if I don't answer anything um, of your guys' questions um, in, in these slides, um, Jay will bring forth the ones that you guys asked um, in the Q&A. This is the biggest one I've been asked. 
can athletes compete in more than one sport per season? It's a great question. So um, the answer is generally yes, but I wanted to just expand out this slide a little bit further. And I apologize that it has double numbers on there. That's my fault. Um, but so just to kind of give you guys the different scenarios where athletes can and cannot um, do multiple sports. So here are the scenarios. So scenario one is athletes can train and compete in an individual sport and a team sport um, in the same season. So if you are wanting to compete in swimming and soccer, that's fabulous. Please do that. Just know, um, and again, this is in the FAQs, some of the expanded um, explanation, is that if you do do that, um, our policy is that you prioritize the team sport. The reason is, is because if you're competing on a soccer team and you're competing in on a swim team, um, your swim, your soccer team is really going to be impacted because it's a roster of people. Um, and so we just um, require that the athlete prioritizes the team sport, um, because if you're competing in swimming, you're just as an individual. So it doesn't impact a larger team in terms of we don't do team scoring. I think the thing to consider here is relays. So if you are competing on a team sport and you're competing in an individual sport that offers relays, um, it's just working with your coach to communicate that you are also competing on a team um, and that you either, I would recommend not participating in relays, but I think just knowing that um, that would be a challenge if your soccer team did qualify um, that you wouldn't be able to participate on the relay team. So again, um, we would ask that you prioritize the team sport um, just because it's harder to replace people on a roster in that sense. Scenario two would be athletes can train and compete in two individual sports in the same season. The answer is yes. So you would be able to um, compete in athletics and swimming is the example. But again, you'd have to choose a sport. So um, if you qualified to go to state in both, so say you qualified in athletics and you qualified in swimming, you'd have to choose one. So in either scenario one or two, you could only choose one sport just because we, um, as Special Olympics Washington, it's really just hard to schedule everyone. Like, um, in terms of uh, if I was qualified in soccer and athletics, scheduling me to be able to be able to make my races and my soccer games is pretty pretty next to impossible, um, especially when you think about that on a large scale for the number of athletes we might have in an event. Um, so same consideration in number two around relays, but again, encouraging people to participate in two sports. Um, and then the last one is the only place where you actually are not um, allowed to compete in two sport is it would be athletes cannot train in two team sports. So in soccer and softball is the example. Um, reason being is it's similar explanation to the first one, which is um, you wouldn't be able to choose between either because they're both team sports. Um, and so we just encourage people to do um, either an individual sport and a team sport or both individual sports. So um, hopefully that is clear. I feel like there might be a few additional questions related to that. But again, um, I know Jay is going to drop in the FAQ document. Um, and that does have those further explanations in each one. So I'd ask that you read through those and then please reach out if you guys do have additional questions around what you can and can't do related to this question specifically. But again, encouraging athletes to participate in two sports where they can and where they're able to um, facilitate because I know that can be a lot as well. Okay, so is this move in line with the special mix mission? I had answered that earlier, but I know that question came up a lot. The answer is yes. So we're in line um, just with offering year round sports and competition um, opportunities, whether that's training or specific um, competitive events. Um, and so the answer is yes on that one. Um, and of course we will encourage or continue to just reevaluate, as I said, and make sure that this is the best um, program possible offered for our athletes. Um, can you address the concerns about coaches who coach sports that are being combined? Um, we know that's going to be a challenge. Um, so the example is if you um, coach softball in the summer and now softball is moving to spring and you also coach soccer, how will the coaches deal with that? Um, it'll be a challenge. And I think the, the transparent communication is um, likely that the coaches will have to make a choice between coaching soccer and softball. And we recognize that that will be an issue that programs will have to deal with is um, just figuring out who will coach what, what sports are possible to be offered. 
Um, and so um, I think that we will just continue to work with you all to understand the needs of coaches um, and continue to recruit. I know it's on the mind of our, our volunteer team as well as our staff of just trying to understand the needs of our teams and how we can better support recruiting and then making sure that we're continuing to bring coaches in um, to um, support the different sports on that. Um, can you address the concern about facilities? Facilities, yes. We know this is a challenge. We deal with this um, at, uh, at the regional and state level as well, just in terms of availability. I know that this really applies to practice facilities and just the timing that things are available. Um, and so we're working through a few things. Even I even think since our last call, when this question was initially um, reviewed is just, I think we're just gonna look at multiple different ways to try to alleviate some of the pressure. I think the challenge with facilities doesn't only apply to Special Olympics. I know in just talking with other sports organizations, um, it's becoming more and more of a challenge, especially as schools are just becoming more restrictive on third party use. Um, and just the growth in the offering of the different types of youth sports too, um, just the competition that we deal with to try to get in with facilities. So I don't have a clear answer on that, but I recognize that it's a concern. And so we're just working through our different channels, whether that's, you know, the example of working with our partnership that we, partnerships that we have with the schools to identify what schools might be able to help us um, more easily get facilities for some of our adult teams um, and that's obviously partnerships through our youth teams that participate through the schools so how can we better connect those groups how can we work with um, different partners um, to be able to get access um, and more use to facilities so that'll be an ongoing um, conversation and one that we will address as a team um, why is fall starting at the end of july early august that's a great question one that came up quite a bit um, as I said, um, there are some challenges around, you only have so much time in a year. Um, and so obviously um, a big pillar that we built everything off of was winter games. So just adjusting the timelines based off of that and the ideal um, season time structure that we were hoping to have. Um, sorry, my dog is going crazy. It's just gonna be one second. Hopefully you guys can't hear that. And that's while you're while you're pausing. Uh, just a reminder: if you could please put your questions in the Q and A um, instead of the chat, we just want to make sure that they don't get lost within some of the comments. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Jay. Um, sorry if you guys hear my dog. Hopefully you don't. Um, or you might see my husband coming in. The... Sorry, guys. I'm just gonna pause for one second. Okay, so um, Jay, can you hear him or no? I can't hear him anymore. Okay, great. Um, okay, so just um, again, why did why did the um, seasons land? Uh, sorry, you guys, so distracting. Just give me one second. Also, okay. for some reason, I can't post in the chat, but thank you to Tyler, who is uh, the poster proxy for me. Yes, thank you, Tyler. Sorry, you guys. Um, I don't know if you all have dogs who get very excited when people come home, but mine is one of those, so apologies. I'm glad you guys couldn't hear him, but I was a little distracted, so. Okay, back to the question is why is fall season starting at the end of uh, July, early August? Again, um, we only have so many weeks in a season, so I think, or in a year, so just doing our best to build out you know, we're hoping to have a 12 to 13 week season. We're hoping to have those couple of weeks in between of off season. Um, and then obviously kind of results in having that summer recreation period. So um, that is ultimately just where it kind of landed as we built off of the winter games um, in terms of kind of the dates um, that that stuck to. Um, how will we facilitate more competition at a local level? This is a great, question. So I referenced it above, um, also something called sports advancement that we are working on here that we are, we'll share more um, throughout this year. But the concept of sports advancement is something that is kind of being a, a, a movement that's going through Special Olympics right now, which is just um, how do sports advance from like when you start a new sport, how would that new sport grow from being 
a local recreational sport to a region um, offered at a region level to offered at a state games. And so that hasn't really, has not existed in Washington and something that doesn't exist in a lot of other states. Um, we are following models from other states or adopting what other states are doing in terms of hosting and having just really strategic plans on how do we grow our sports and specific sports and make sure that we have a, a system that's set up to support the growth of those sports. So the example I gave is pickleball. So for pickleball, um, our goal would be to post criteria that says like, hey, during summer recreation period, if you guys wanna try pickleball just to get a taste of it, if you'd wanna ever do it in fall, um, go for it. Here are the rules, here's how to um, just locally either recreate or put on a local competition. Um, and so the idea would be that we would post criteria that says when pickleball reaches X amount of participation, we would add it in at a region level and offer region competition. And then um, once we get to the point where we have enough regional competition from each one of the regions, so enough particip participation within the Northwest, Southwest and East region, we'd say awesome. They, this is the number that we needed to hit to put it at a state games to see pickleball at that level. So that is some of the criteria that we will be looking at in terms of like how to implement new sports, um, foster growth, and then also make sure that they um, have enough people who can compete in them. So um, that's kind of one part of the answer around how will we facilitate more competition at a local level. But I think our plan is by elongating those seasons and then just providing really clear guidelines for how to, what local competition means um, is something that we will be doing over the next year. Um, so it won't happen right out of the gate. Um, we will be piloting some models this summer, or even in the fall um, to kind of just see what this will look like. Um, but the goal is, is that um, local competition um, will help us kind of feeder into better divisioning and better understanding of how teams compete. So actually when I joined the organization in 2013, um, some of the coaches might remember this, when you actually did a preseason form, you would actually have to commit to three um, competitions that you would facilitate with other coaches um, prior to showing up to a regional event. So you would say like, I'm gonna compete you know, for basketball, I'm gonna play X team in this city on this date, um, just at their gym, at their practice time. So there's a couple different ways you can look at local competition. So whether that is something that is um, more organized, like what you see at a regional level um, that's supported by volunteers, and staff, um, or it's more informal where it's like that inner squad, um, coaches are getting each other's comp, um, contact information and just an understanding of who's actually doing that sport who might be at a similar level. Um, obviously there's some challenges to local competition around like if you live in a more rural area, the drive time is not ideal. So how do we facilitate that? So of course that will be a challenge that we'll have to work through. Um, but if you do live um, in a place where you have teams nearby, um, being able to facilitate um, everything from like a formal um, local event competition to a more informal like recreational, um, um, sorry, I lost my word, um, an informal um, inner squad or something that allows you to just get that competition or that game before you guys are showing up to the regional event. So a lot more planning um, that we are putting into that. And obviously as we build it out, we will continue to share. Um, and it, um, something that we obviously um, would love to just get more feedback from coaches on, on the challenges that will exist around this, but excited to move into that model um, and be able to get some best practices from New York to um, facilitate as much as we can um, that actually works for people. Okay, so another question is, will there be softball this year? Yes, there will be softball in this coming coming up summer here in 2024. Um, it, softball will be recreational. So will um, golf and bocce. Um, so what that means is basically you guys can, um, will have an opportunity to um, participate in softball, but there won't really be any formal competition in terms of region and state. Um, so as I said, um, challenge there just with the timing of um, transitioning. So I think our hope is um, working with um, and something we're still putting together that we will share out is what kind of opportunities can we provide for more, that more local competition, as I just said, 
um, whether that's um, smaller events being hosted by teams or inner squads, those kind of things where you can still have some form of competition, it will just look different than what a region um, or a state competition has looked like for softball traditionally. So, um, and then softball will be offered, offered next year um, and it will be a sport in, that will be offered in the spring. Um, and there will be region events that will ha be happening for softball next spring. So a um, little bit of a hiatus for our softball golf bocce um, teams this summer, but again, um, with the full intent to be able to offer something for those groups who are wanting to um, participate in those sports um, recreationally this summer. Okay, and then what will paperwork deadlines look like? It's a really good question um, and something we are still working through. So um, um, part of that, uh, this question is related to our hope to, some of you have heard us mention, even if you were at the leadership conference this last year, um, that we will be moving into a new registration system at some point. Um, and so our goal is that we will be looking to do that this summer. Um, and that is um, part of what will kind of determine our deadlines is just changing how you guys have um, can see certain participants or manage credentialing for your athletes. Um, we're hoping that will alleviate a lot of um, the questions or understanding of who has what. And so um, this one is still being determined, but as soon as we have them, um, our goal is to start getting in the mindset of posting annual timelines so that everyone knows when to expect when to register, um, when you guys need to submit information. I think one thing we know is the earlier we're able to provide information, the easier it is for coaches to plan, um, for families to plan, um, to be able to get things done and submitted so they can compete. So we know the paperwork isn't the fun stuff, um, but we wanna make it as easy as possible for athletes to just get on the field. So that's the goal, so more to come on that one. And then weather was one that came up quite a bit. So why do we move golf during the nice weather for the west side? So um, I don't know. It's been an unusually nice um, time for the west side. I know we've had a bit of rain on and off. But the biggest thing that we looked at within the committee, too, is really looking at weather um, and just, like, what are the challenges we're going to have? Whether, you know, the example of winter is that we need snow for snow sports. Um, and so that was a big factor. But one thing that came up, particularly for our east side teams, is that it's incredibly hot in the summer for that side of the state. Um, and so when we were just looking at adjustments in terms of like, you know, the, the, the starting the end of August for fall and kind of where we would land with summer recreation um, is that that was just pinpointed as a really, really, really hot time for our east side folks. So it might be the best time of weather for the west side, but again, we have to look at things from a statewide lens of just what it will, what will we hope will work the best for everyone? Again, I wish I could anticipate the weather, um, but I know that was a big conversation we had in the committee is just how can we um, adjust to different um, weather um, that might work best, kind of be the happy medium of both sides of the state just because the weather patterns are very different um, for those groups. So um, that was kind of um, a long-winded answer to um, why did we move golf during the nice weather? Um, part of that was just the consideration for our east side of the state um, and knowing that golf is something that can happen year round. Not ideal, obviously, for the east side if you're doing it in the winter when they have tons of snow, um, but knowing that we you can golf through um, a bit of rain here on the west side. So again, not ideal, but we plan for the, try to plan for the best um, window of opportunity we can here. So again, as I said, We'll continue to iterate. So I think, you know, continuing to share feedback of how things are going um, related to some of the challenges that you guys are either continuing to see or that pop up as still being a challenge. So, Jay, those were my questions, at least that I targeted. So you want to give me any that I missed? Sure. We have about 10 minutes left. We can, we can get through as many as we can tonight. And if not, um, if you don't get to all of them, we will update the FAQ, which is linked to in the chat. Um, let's see here. Will athletes have to be registered in clear medical during the summer rec periods? Say that again. Sorry. Will athletes have to be registered in clear medical during summer rec periods? Yes. So I thought I maybe included this question in the last one, but um, yes. So to you always have to register to be 
considered eligible in Special Olympics. So our goal for summer season rec is to just make it as easy as possible. Um, so we are just looking at ways to um, set that up as a rec for a recreation period to be a bit easier. Um, but you do have to have medical forms to participate um, in summer recreation, um, just because there will be an approval process. So like if you know, I decide I'm going to do a cornhole during the summer, I would still have to register and say, here is where I'm practicing, um, or I'm hoping to practice, here's how long I'm going to practice, um, and then here are the people on my team. Because part of how our insurance works in terms of coverage for you all is knowing who's on the list, like what are the names of the people, um, and then do they have forms. And so the, the part that we're hoping to get to that would hypothetically make it easier that I can't promise at this point that we're trying to work through is whether, um, well, I guess you'd say I can't promise what that's going to look like. So, um, but yes, you will have to have medical forms to participate in the summer. Um, and that's something that um, isn't different from any other season. Um, we need to make sure that coaches have forms when athletes show up for practice on that first day. Um, if you do have athletes who are showing up who are practicing and don't have those forms, I would just, um, say it's just recommended to have them wait until they do have those forms just for the, the insurance um, risk aspect. So we know those forms are a challenge. I know um, there's a lot of conversation happening at the international level of how do we just make those forms shorter, easier, less of a barrier for our participants. So I, as much as you guys hope that that will be in our future, just because um, I know that that is a challenge. Okay. Um, if there is no snow in a location for winter games, can the sport be relocated instead of being canceled? Um, that's a really good question. So, and that happened this year um, with cross country skiing and snowshoeing. Um, so typically um, it's a, it's a challenge, I would say. Um, it doesn't mean that it can't happen. I think that in this year, um, you know, I think part of what we are working through organizationally is just having better contingency plans for when sports um, are potentially not going to be offered. I think in some cases with certain sports, it's possible where it's easier to switch venues or change course. Um, for cross country and snowshoeing, uh, it's challenging in terms of just the logistics that go into that event. Um, and so for this year, we just feasibly weren't able to move a, because facilities weren't available, um, and B, because it logistically was a big lift to be able to move in such a short period of time, um, because we actually made that call 10 days before, 10 to 15 days before the event, um, before winter games start. So, and I think the thing to remember is that, you know, that sport is only one piece of a larger event that's being planned um, organizationally. And so to move it hypothetically sounds easy for one sport, but it's really not when you consider um, how it is kind of intertwined with the rest of our operation that we're trying to um, execute. And so I think that's always our goal. We are, it's always our goal to try to find an alternative um, and in the places where we can't. Um, it's hard for us too, because we put not only a lot of time in planning, but we know how hard it is for athletes who have trained to say like, hey, no, we can't offer this for how much time our coaches put into training and pre prepping to take athletes. So um, I know that that's what, it wasn't a clear answer, but I think that's always our goal is to have a contingency. Um, and in the cases where we don't, um, like for this year, I think we really look at, you know, how can we plan better for that in future years to see if um, we can come up with better alternatives. Um, <clears throat> will there be any funds or money for summer recreation or for local competitions? That's a great question. Um, I think right now we are working through what that will look like and where that will come from. But I think that's our hope is to um, try to provide, um, I think one, one part of it is getting a sense of what's, what, is, what are people willing to host um, and what does that look like? Um, and so I think that um, that is our goal, but right now we're kind of in a phase of just trying to assess like what it is that people need funding for. Um, and so um, that is something we're kind of working through at the moment. So it's a very good question. I think, I hope so. The answer I, I hope is yes, um, in terms of us being able to figure out um, how much and then what that funding is used for is the outstanding question. How will SOA facilitate local competitions? Um, does it say for this season or just in general? 
general? Yes, I think I addressed that earlier, but I think just the thing to reiterate about local competition is in the, in the realm of Special Olympics, local competition is really driven by volunteers um, or um, local teams who are, uh, like I said, putting together their own um, idea of competition, I guess. It's not their own idea of competition. That's a bad way to phrase it. Um, I think there's, um, it's just meant to be a little bit more informal. So at a state level, you see a lot in terms of like opening ceremonies, there's a dance, there's multiple facets, there's thousands of people. Regional is kind of a step down from that. In some cases we have opening ceremonies and some we don't, just depends on the sport. Um, we're looking at hundreds of athletes versus a local competition would be quite a bit smaller, a hundred or less, um, or even smaller in some cases. Um, like I said, could be formal and informal whether that's um, a good example is we have um, hot bocce that gets hosted, which is what Deb calls it um, in the Pullman area where she hosts a day event um, where there's a bocce competition. She hosts it as a volunteer, um, teams show up. She kind of organizes a schedule. Um, people bring their own lunches. It's like a, a more of a recreational type of event, but the goal is to be able to compete with a focus on the sport. Um, and so that's one good example um, that is um, available, which just came to mind. But I think this kind of will vary in terms of what, um, what this looks like. So more information to come. I think for this summer, you'll see it as more of an informal recreational participation. Great, so um, with regard to facilities and bowling, um, there's a couple of questions here, let me try to paraphrase them, but what considerations were taken into what, what was taken into consideration when deciding on switching bowling and the availability of bowling facilities? So bowling did not switch. Bowling is staying in the fall. And it's just the earlier time frame, right? Or the earlier start? Yeah, it's just the earlier time frame. Um, so is that what the question is referencing? No, just wondering how uh, bowling and the availability of bowling alleys were uh, considered as part of the decision? Um, so, I, I mean, every sport was considered in what we decided. I think for bowling, it's our biggest, biggest sport. Um, I think we have like 3,600 participants. Reason being, it's the most adaptable. Um, the challenge with bowling actually is really a facilities issue too, is there's only so many bowling facilities. We saw a lot of bowling facilities get shut down in the pandemic. Um, and so I think the challenge there is we can only plan for so much in terms of like when we're considering all these sports, we have 21 sports on our seasonal, on our annual calendar. Um, and so we try to do our best to accommodate for each of the sports. Um, I'm not sure if I'm hitting the exact answer that you're looking for on bowling. I think that every sport was taken into consideration. Um, so if you guys are having challenges, please let your program managers know um, so they can kind of help you guys work through that or at least um, let us know that like you're really having some barriers so that we can keep that in mind um, for future season, um, for future just reviews of this overall plan. That's great. And if that wasn't your specific question, if that was a poor paraphrase, if you could just um, resubmit it via the Smartsheet form that is linked to in the chat, that would be great. We can address it that way as well. But I think we have time for one more question. Um, and that is with the new setup, how will the locations of state games change, if at all? Um, that's a good question. So um, we really like being in the locations that we're in. So it's a fabulous question. Um, I feel like it's been pretty unanimous. Everyone loves Wenatchee. Um, I don't see us moving away from Wenatchee. Um, they've been huge um, in terms of a partnership for a very, very long time. Um, so I don't anticipate that change. Um, same with Tri-Cities. Um, they started their games, I think in 2018, 2017, 2018. I'm um, have been amazing. Um, love working with them. There's a lot of opportunity to grow. Um, so I imagine us staying in Tri-Cities for fall. Um, and then spring games is one that has been a little bit more challenging. Um, I do see these games staying on the west side. Um, the challenge that we've had with those games is housing capacity um, in terms of um, just our ability to be able to bring more athletes is really limited by 
housing when we're talking about Pacific Lutheran. Um, so it's a good problem to have in terms of having a lot of participation. So it is something that we are looking at for 2025 and beyond is what um, other um, opportunities can we look at to just be able to expand that piece. So I can't say for sure where those games will land over the next few years. It is something that we are reviewing at this point, um, but I anticipate that those games will stay on the west side, um, just given that we have Wenatchee and Tri-Cities, so two east side state tournaments. Um, it's nice to have a little bit of balance for either group in terms of travel um, and just kind of what, whatever can best accommodate seasons too, so. Right. Well, I think we have a minute left. We were not able to get to all the questions in the Q and A, and I, I'm just at a glance and seeing there are a few in the chat. So after this, we will just go through both of those sections of the webinar and address them um, offline. So we apologize for not being able to get to them live. But over to you. Awesome. Okay. Well, I only have one more slide here. Thank you, guys. Thanks for being here tonight and making time. Um, I know that we have so many volunteers, families, athletes, unified partners who put so much time into training or prepping or supporting um, throughout the year. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you for, um, you know, sticking with us. Um, we know change is hard. We're going to do everything we can to make this as easy as possible um, and support you guys in all the different ways. Um, we know it won't be perfect, but our goal is to make it the best that we can and then just continue to iterate. So as Jay said, um, I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions. I know there were quite a few. Um, I will um, address those and add those to the FAQ document um, and this um, make sure that I follow up um, on the specific questions um, that are captured there. So again, thank you all so much. Um, really appreciate it. I hope you have a great evening and hope to see you soon. <laughs>